We are here to say that we shouldn't even be stigmatized with the word welfare. For the rich, it's called subsidy. For the poor, welfare. When Mr. Pullman's railway or his boxcars, when he overextended himself and when it flunked, the government compensated or subsidized him. Call that subject and put Mr. Pullman on welfare, they subsidized him. The state of Illinois, 90 cents out of every dollar on these highways come from Washington. The state of Illinois is on welfare. The whole state is on welfare. state income tax and they're talking about raising hundreds of millions of dollars in Illinois but if that money is going to be spent on highways if it's going to be spent on earmarked funds for thoroughbred horses and for grade crossing protections then I'm against it if it's going to be spent for our school children if it's going to be spent for hunger then I'm for it. People are unemployed today not because they're lazy. People are unemployed not because they don't want to work. The fact is, some of you gathered here have worked the hardest and the longest on the nastiest job. And the technology that we work to produce has rendered us economically useless. The only question left for leadership Will today's unemployed group be seen as the success of America's economy? The Penny Sightseeing Company runs daily tours of the five square mile area that is home for half a million Negroes and Puerto Ricans. The company is owned by a Negro couple, Claude and Penny Ruffin. We're coming now into what is considered the tenement section of our meaning that most of the houses that you see as we pass are apartment houses. There are very few private homes on this avenue, 8th Avenue, which is what we're going down now. Uh, you will notice on the streets garbage. Uh, uh, some of the, the cans which you see filled with garbage have not been collected for from two to three days, and this is uh, why uh, these houses, many of them are dilapidated, and there are many of the apartments that are overcrowded. And this, of course, creates a problem uh, pertaining to housing, to the Negro living in this particular section. Most of the tourists who come to Harlem are from Europe, usually on their first trip to America. This group of 50 was made up of Scandinavians, mostly from Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. Some of the people from Scandinavia said they wanted to come to Harlem because they'd seen some of its disturbances on European television. Now they wanted to see what Harlem itself was like. Penny Ruffin, who leads the tour, said it takes in some spots that even most Harlem residents never heard of. One of them is Jamel Manchin in the Sugar Hill District. Uh, you notice the cobblestone street? This is the only street of its kind in New York City. Uh, the houses on this street were used by the officers as their headquarters during uh, the Revolutionary War. And the structure, you'll notice, of the house is the same as when they were built. They, of course, have been taken care of, they've been maintained, but nevertheless, the structure, the build of them is the same as it was, which is over 200 years ago. And the house over here to your right is Jim Mansion. Mansion. This house was built by Roger Morris in 1775 and bought by Jumel. Jumel was a French wine merchant and he bought the house as a gift to his wife who was an American. Uh, and the house is named after Jumel, uh, called Jumel Mansion. The bus drove through Strivers Row, so named because it was for a long time a symbol to Negroes of success of striving and making it. The tour also stops at the New Breed Shop. It's owned by the community, 20,000 shares at a dollar a share. 
The shop sells African-style clothes, and the operators take pride in the identity. They say their clothes give the black man. Then came Harlem Odyssey, a community-operated center to rehabilitate drug addicts. The tourists are given lunch in one of Harlem's finer restaurants. On this day, it was Frank's on 125th Street. They see the Apollo Theater, where Sammy Davis sometimes performs. And the Negro-owned Freedom National Bank. And, of course, the shops along 125th Street. So we learn, though Harlem may not have been much of a tourist attraction in the past, it is one now. And because of that, the community is able to dispel some illusions of at least those people who take the time to come see it. To wipe out some misconceptions that come from bad publicity or miseducation. To show people that Harlem is not really all slum and not in a constant state of turmoil, not to mention violence. And that it's awakened and that it's changing. Jack Paxton, NBC News, Harlem. Gates and Sumner Avenues intersect in the heart of a Brooklyn slum. Mrs. Ruthie Williamson lives at 652 Gates Avenue in a five-room city-owned apartment on the second floor. The apartment rents for $68 a month. She pays the rent and provides for herself and six children on a regular welfare allotment of $200 semi-monthly. She also receives $700 a year in special grants for clothing and household furnishings. Mrs. Williamson came to New York from North Carolina 25 years ago. She's been on welfare eight years. Her husband left her nine years ago, and she does not know where he is. She carries on the best she can. I have five boys. And they really tears up the clothes. I can't tell them not to play. They go outside, they climb, they play football. And they play basketball and they end up busting up the shoes, busting up the pants. And every time I look around, they got a busted pair of pants. And I don't have a sewing machine, so I can't sew them up. I sew the best I can on my hand, but it still doesn't, it doesn't look good enough for them to go to school. Bernard likes to do anything he see anybody else do. Football, wrestling, everything else you see the big children do, he likes to do it too. He has a car everywhere he goes. He has a car. And usually I had some smaller cars, but I had them in my pocket yesterday and I lost them. That's why I didn't get that large one. Shortly before noon each day, Mrs. Williamson walks one block to PS 129 to pick up her five-year-old daughter, Jennifer, from kindergarten. Three-year-old Bernard is always with her, unmindful of the surroundings he has known all his life. All these houses are owned by New York City Housing Authority. They're going to take the whole block down. I am waiting to be placed in city housing, but they, I have been told they don't have a place large enough for my family. The only ones now that are left in this block are the ones that's on welfare. All the ones that's not on welfare, they have moved them out of the block. Now, I would like to move out of this neighborhood into a decent housing. So I'm sick of going from one slum to another one. Every day you see people getting, people's purse getting snatched and people getting knocked in the head and the people being mugged in cars. Even in cabs, in certain cabs you can't even get in now. Because you can get in certain cabs, they'll mug you in the cabs. You leave your house, you don't know how you're going to come back. You may not even get back that day. The food... It's very expensive around here. So most time they have to catch sales, especially raw form. They have good, nice sales on certain days. Because check day is rough. I mean, everything is high on check day. Find the first and sixteenth, everything goes up. So I wait till after first and sixteenth, about the third or the fourth of the month. Then I do my shopping. 
until late November, Mrs. Williamson lived four doors up the street at 668 Gates Avenue. There, she paid $100 a month for a slightly larger apartment. Again, the city was her landlord. She was the frequent victim of burglars, who on one occasion stole a television set, an iron, dishes, an electric knife, and a toaster. She had bought most of these items on time only three weeks earlier and had to go on paying for them even though she had lost them forever. Despite the condition of the building, Mrs. Williamson got out of it only when thieves took some pipes that cut off the heat. The city then put the family in the apartment they now occupy. Two of Mrs. Williamson's grade school children, Gregory, 12, and Kevin, 9, return home in mid-afternoon. She tries to see to it that they study. Two older children come home later. Mrs. Williamson is fearful about what might happen to her family growing up in a bad neighborhood. The neighborhood is is full of it's full of dope addicts. I mean, it's getting to the place that these addicts are right, uh, stand right in front of abandoned donuts and take the needles and the kids looking at them. And every time you walk the street, all these most of these kids you see, they got this glue in their hand, and it's getting to be terrible. These nine and ten year old children out here taking dope, and I'm scared. Everybody's around. Everybody's afraid. The whole neighborhood is afraid. You're afraid to go out in the street at night, and you can't find a policeman. Video, no policeman's nowhere around. And we're just afraid. Check day comes twice a month, normally on the 1st and the 16th. The checks are usually mailed out, but not always, and check day invariably finds the welfare centers crowded with clients looking for their money. Most welfare clients do not have bank accounts. They have virtually nothing to save and very little use for personal checks. So they generally deal with storefront check cashers. There's a fee involved, one half of one percent, plus a small carrying charge. The rates are set by state law. Clients can also purchase money orders and pay some of their bills here. The cost of doing business with a check casher is higher than it would be at a bank, but the check casher absorbs losses of several million dollars a year because of stolen and forged checks. Each of the city's poor communities has a multitude of stores geared to the culture of poverty. On welfare check day, these stores are more crowded than usual. Markets under the railroad tracks on Upper Park Avenue are very popular. The poor come from all over Central and East Harlem to shop for bargains. They come here partly because at many food stores in their own neighborhoods, the sales come off and the prices go up on welfare check day. At many furniture and appliance stores in the ghettos, sales are a way of business life. But Caveat emptor, purchaser beware. The customer often pays more by buying inferior goods, by paying inflated prices, and by taking long-term credit with little or no credit rating. The transactions are almost always legal, but the laws are weighted heavily against the poor. Housing is an unending problem for people on welfare. However, relatively few clients live in such squalor as the occupants of two five-story buildings just off Park Avenue on 123rd Street. The block has been a hangout for addicts and derelicts, and welfare clients who live here have frequently been mugged or robbed on or shortly after check day. The building at 105 East 123rd Street, owned by Benjamin Wilk of 390 Wadsworth Avenue in Upper Manhattan, is a rooming house for singles and doubles. The rooms are connected to long hallways which lead to a common kitchen and toilet. The Department of Rent and Housing Maintenance told NBC News it most recently inspected this building in September. At that time, according to a department spokesman, an inspector found that 13 of 15 previous violations had been removed. The two remaining were for broken glass in public hallways. The spokesman said it was possible more violations would be found when the place was inspected again. 
The rooms are small. It does not take much furniture to make them overcrowded. The hot plate did not come with this room. The occupant, who did not wish to be identified, refuses to cook in the common kitchen. The rent for this room is $15 a week. Since the occupant is on welfare, the rent is paid for by the city. The adjoining building at 107 East 123rd contains family apartments. The owner is listed as the Elkhart Realty Corporation of 22 East 40th Street in Manhattan. Elkhart is headed by a man named Henry R. Kahn. The Rent and Building Maintenance Department said this building was also inspected in September and at that time was found to have 15 pending violations. Those included rubbish in the courtyard and painting violations. The department spokesman said such violations can be taken to court if not cleared up in 30 days. But court action had not been taken as of last week. One apartment has been occupied since last February by an unwed welfare mother with seven children. The mother did not want to be photographed, but some of her children were willing. The rent for this apartment is $125 a month, paid for by the city. The mother said intruders had tried to break into her apartment three times in the last three months. She also told of big rats that come out from under the sink at night and virtually occupy the kitchen. So far, no one in the family has been bitten. The family has lived through a lot and is prepared for another Christmas. But it would like nothing better than to move out to another place. Good afternoon, Fox and Mummy.